Another <coughs> campaign we developed a few years later was called the Pepsi Challenge. We began the Pepsi Challenge uh, in San Antonio, Texas, a market I mentioned earlier where we were outsold uh, nine or 10 to one. And what we were looking for with the Pepsi Challenge, because we had found with our consumer taste tests that we had a slight preference of Pepsi over Coke as long as you didn't tell anybody what the product was. The history of Pepsi was that uh, if you wanted to serve your family or friends a cola drink and you had Coca-Cola in your refrigerator, you would typically walk out to the living room with a bottle of Coke in your hand and a glass and you'd pour it in front of them and put the bottle of Coke down next to the glass. If it was Pepsi, you would go out to the kitchen, you'd pour it in the kitchen and only bring the glass of cola out and hope they didn't ask what was in it. So Pepsi had a real disadvantage in terms of image back in those early 1970s. So what we were looking for in San Antonio, Texas, a market where it was almost guaranteed that most people had never e even tasted a Pepsi, more or less had any interest to try a different soft drink, where they drank Coke for breakfast, where Coca-Cola was a staple for most people in San Antonio, Texas. All we wanted with the Pepsi Challenge taste test, because we knew we won uh, on a blind basis when you didn't identify what the brand was, uh, what we wanted was to capture in just a few seconds the expression of just the Coke drinkers, not the Pepsi drinkers, just the Coke drinkers, when they discovered that they had picked Pepsi over Coca-Cola. One of the famous commercials we did with Pepsi Challenge was of a grandmother with her little granddaughter standing uh, right behind her, looking over her shoulder, and the minister of the taste test uh, is being videoed, and he's saying, now I want you to try cup A. And she takes cup A. He said, now I'd like you to try cup B, which had another cola in it. She didn't know which brand was in either cup A or cup B. The little granddaughter is watching and not saying a thing. Then the person administering the test pulls up the uh, cover that's revealing what the brands are behind the cups. And the little granddaughter says, Grandma, you picked Pepsi. And the grandma says, I can't believe it. I never had a Pepsi in my life. I guess I must like Pepsi better than Coke. Bang. Eight or nine seconds, and it changed the world of advertising. That was the beginning of the experience marketing campaign that we used, and we took that market by market across the U.S. Our bottlers were much weaker than the Coca-Cola bottlers. So before we would allow them to go into the Pepsi Challenge campaign, they had to buy new uniforms. They had to paint their trucks. They had to increase their quality assurance inside the plant. They had to clean their plants. Uh, all of these things helped build the morale and the stature and the dignity of those weak Pepsi organizations. And when they came out with those Pepsi Challenge uh, campaigns, uh, it changed everything in the markets. Coca-Cola was so outraged that Pepsi would run a campaign uh, which would suggest that our product was better than their product, and they felt denigrate the product, the first thing they did was to sue Pepsi. And they said, we think this is unlawful advertising. Wham, it's all over the press. You know, why is Coke suing Pepsi? Uh, Pepsi's a little tiny regional brand. Next they came out and Coke was running a very famous, beautiful commercial called Mean Joe Green, the football player uh, in uh, Pittsburgh for the Steelers. And uh, they had me and Joe Green go to sales meetings in new markets. And I remember when we opened the Phoenix market uh, the night before we launched the campaign and we had the sales force of the Pepsi organization there. Coke ran a counter Pepsi challenge sales meeting in another hotel. And they had me and Joe Green come in for their sales force and smash a Pepsi vending machine with a sledgehammer. We managed to get a picture of it and it went all over every newspaper in the United States. What in the world is going on with Coca-Cola that they're so concerned? Coke also surrounded uh, a Pepsi sales meeting in another market. They took all their Coke route trucks in that territory, and it was almost like uh, Indians surrounding the uh, covered wagons. Uh, they went and they surrounded the hotel where we were having our sales meeting before the uh, launch of a Pepsi challenge in another city. And of course, that got all over the press. 
Coke decided to run a commercial that would spoof the Pepsi challenge and try to denigrate it as being unimportant. So they created a commercial with two chimpanzees, and the chimpanzees would take the taste test and pick cup A or cup B. Well, the press had a field day with that. They said, what is going on with Coca-Cola? Why are they so disturbed about what Pepsi's doing? Little Pepsi, very little advertising budget compared to Coke's. Uh, Coke, a brilliant company, uh, the world's most valuable brand at that time, uh, and yet they were reacting in a way that opened the opportunity for Pepsi to build its business. And we took Pepsi Challenge in market after market where Pepsi wasn't sold uh, really to any degree at all. So if you go out a few years later, by 1978, uh, Pepsi had received an award from A.C. Nielsen as the largest selling consumer packaged goods uh, that they measured uh, in the United States. Not just soft drinks, we were already number one selling soft drinks as measured by Nielsen. We were the largest selling of any product measured by Nielsen in the entire United States. So that's a story of persistence, a story of being an adaptive innovator and saying we can adapt to the condition that we're just a regional brand, but we have strengths in a, in a few regional markets, uh, that we found a few strengths that we did have a better tasting product on a blind basis than Coke, but not by much, they're pretty much commodity products with each other. Um, but we were hungry. You know, we were willing to change the rules because there was no way we could possibly win against Coca-Cola if we played with their rules. They were just too good a marketing company. But if we changed the rules, if we redefined the market in a different way, if we said the market isn't just the stores we used to sell, but we're going to open up and be more aggressive in the new channels like mass merchandises and drug chains, if we're going to not just sell in the little packages that Coke dominated, but we're going to go in and sell in a brand new two liter package, if we're going to change the way in which we promoted this by putting disruptive pricing on these extra large size packages uh, and head for the heavy users, if we went into territories that Pepsi was virtually unknown and be able to spoof Coca-Cola with the Pepsi Challenge advertising, all of these were game-changing strategies. And we did it consistently year after year after year because we were hungry. And that's exactly what an adaptive innovator has to do today. It's a much more sophisticated market today. And I'm not just talking about soft drinks. I'm talking about any market, consumer market, business category, product market, service business. Uh, you've got to think like I'm hungry. You know, I want to do something. There has to be a better way to do it. That's what adaptive innovators do. It's about being an adaptive business builder. And there are those of us who just love building transformative businesses. And more and more, that's going to become a mainstream occupation of more and more people because that's where the jobs are. That's where the future is.